I mean, this is a November monthly forum. Uh, Oxford Humans is about uh, death. You know, we're talking about death and with the belief that there is love, life after death. And that's the kind of uh, belief we support and encourage uh, people to share. And we, this is actually the second uh, death forum after the UK Korea Death Forum we had uh, in October. And there will be more, and I will actually make an announcement about, about that towards the end of this uh, talk today. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Peter Fenwick to you. Uh, perhaps I don't need really uh, to introduce Dr. Fenwick uh, to you. Um, he's so well known in this area. Um, Dr. Fenwick uh, studied natural science at Cambridge and he became a doctor and worked at uh, Maudsley Hospital in London. And also he lectured uh, as a senior lecturer at King's College uh, London. And uh, he worked, has been working in very uh, diverse uh, fields uh, related to neuroscience. I mean, he is a neuropsychiatrist and his work on epilepsy is uh, very well known. And he also wrote many hundreds of uh, scholarly articles on the question of brain functions and brain-mind uh, relationship. And now he is uh, leading a meditation group in Science and Medical Network, but he was formerly uh, the president of that uh, organization. And now he, I understand you are uh, leading the UK branch of INDS, International Association of Near Death Studies. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And Peter Fenwick wrote many books with his wife, Elizabeth Fenwick. Uh, you may have already uh, come across some of his works. Um, I think the most recent one is uh, Shining Light on Transcendence, the unconventional journey of a neuroscientist. I think that was published in 2019. And prior to that, The Truth in the Light, uh, 2012, The Art of Dying, ubiquitous book, uh, even translated in Korean. Uh, that was in 2008. And prior to that, uh, Past Lives, an investigation into reincarnation memories. So uh, Dr. Fenwick's uh, interest is, is diverse, really. He, he covered a vast area of um, what they call uh, parapsychology. Uh, and he's a world authority on the end of uh, life experiences that we'll be looking at today uh, thoroughly. And uh, he also conducted very extensive empirical research on other areas of uh, death related uh, phenomena, okay. like NDs, near death experiences, reincarnation, uh, death communication, out of body experience really, uh, truly, almost all areas related to the matter of life and death. So uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, Dr. Fenwick's talk today uh, that might cover a variety of uh, uh, issues related to, to death. Uh, maybe even weeks may not be enough to hear Dr. Fenwick's views on all of these, uh, but I hope we'll get uh, some gists of uh, his um, ideas about what is death and how to live properly. Um, well, this is, a, I think this is enough. And uh, this is a kind of interview style forum. So I will ask some questions to him and Dr. Fenny will reply, but uh, obviously it, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, in any way on, on these issues. So. I will leave full freedom to Dr. Fenwick to talk about whatever he wishes to, to talk. And the, so we'll have a dialogue for about um, 50 minutes. Let me let, let in people. Hold on, okay, yeah. And then there will be about 30 minutes question and answers. So please uh, 
keep your answers. Don't forget, and I will give you a chance. And uh, you will have 30 minutes for that. I think that's enough. And uh, well, just without uh, further ado, let me start uh, asking what is most obvious and really uh, very interesting questions. First, we're talking about ELEs, end of life experiences. So what is what is ELEs? Well, how do you define? And I mean, I, I will proceed uh, asking a kind of a question as a cluster, and I leave uh, uh, the answers to uh, to Dr. Uh, Fenwick. Uh, and how, how do you define ELEs? And what kind of uh, uh, what types of experiences are there in this category? And uh, do you have any memorable or notable cases uh, to, to mention about these? Um, thank you very much, uh, Jung. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me here to give a talk to you all. Um, uh, I very much look forward to giving these talks and more particularly because uh, when I first entered the field, in really was about the year 2000, and I started looking at death, you could become a world authority very easily. There were two papers, and if you read those two papers, you were a world authority. <laughs> so um, it, it clearly was a very underdeveloped field. People just weren't interested in death and dying. Now, it's a pity because it means we're blanking death and dying out. And uh, if you blank death out, then there is something called the existential fear of death. And the existential fear of death is very, very powerful. Um, there have been some wonderful studies done on it. I'll, I'll just tell you one, and you can see what, how powerful it is. There were two groups of judges which were... Um, uh, arranged by the experimenters said that they their personalities were the same and they also um, decided that one group of judges would have on it and tell us uh, how long do you think you're going to live now that means that that group of people had their existential fear of death raised and so uh, they were then, both groups were given uh, the case of a prostitute who was caught on the streets when she shouldn't have been. And uh, they were told that for this offence, $50 was adequate. So the first group of judges that hadn't had their existential fear of death raised said, well, $50, that's about right. And they all agreed that that was correct. And then they asked the other group, tell us, what do you think about this? And they said, it's the most terrible crime she's committed. It's absolutely awful. She'd be made to pay for it. And they put her, her tariff at $450, nine times higher. Now, that is an amazing thing. These people are judges. And they did this because they, in fact, had been exposed to their fear of death. It's, it's an astonishing experiment. There are a lot, lot more like this. And uh, there are one or two books on these, which I, I would recommend. And I'll let uh, Jung Chi Chai have them, uh, have the names afterwards so that he can circulate them. But yeah. uh, the thing about it is that it alters your behavior as it did the judges and it alters our behavior in everyday life uh, we stick to people who think like ourselves uh, trigger anything in you we sit away or leave a gap between us and other people who don't think like us and uh because we are so afraid of death, we hide it away everywhere. And uh, we're more greedy. We are uh, 
limit ourselves in what we can do and it, it really uh, changes our life in a major way so any society which is going through the problem of a lot of death about then will have this raised within them so look around our society we choose incidentally charismatic leaders as well so um it's very very powerful and it's all hidden well do we know of any society which doesn't have the existential fear of death yes we do uh, those who live in bhutan they have death images everywhere and they're not uh they're not afraid of death and the children are brought up uh, without a fear of death and they're a very different society they're totally free and so i think with that as a background we have to uh try and understand what death is all about no it does matter and the idea that we can brush it down to the carpet in fact is totally wrong because it's changing our behavior and so now we come to jung's question what is an end of life experience well as i said uh there wasn't uh, any information on this there are one or two books um which were written uh around that time haroldson's was one of the books and uh it was looking at end of life experiences uh except they weren't called end of life experiences uh really they were called um uh i think the associated phenomena of death they had very weird names and i was giving a talk in a hospice and they said well why don't you call them end of life experiences so i said yeah about right and so they became to be known as end of life experiences and there's been another huge change in terminology now and they are shared death experiences and we'll go into shared death experiences and there are one or two nice books coming out about that so what are they well the death process begins for most of us uh when we get the diagnosis okay we've got cancer we're going to die and so we have to look at our own mortality well you can see what that's going to do to us if you don't know about existential death anxiety because of course you'll have to go through a period of um becoming used to the idea that you're going to die that's the burmese cat i'm afraid if you can hear him he's complaining he hasn't had his supper <laughs> um so uh we um so we called the men of life experiences think uh today you get the diagnosis you're going to die and you start going downhill as your cancer gets more severe until you come to the point that uh, you probably have to go into a hospice and they um uh, when you go into the hospice you realize you're going to die very forcefully now a lot depends on how you're treated there if you are instructed in the sorts of things that are going to happen you'll have a much easier passage through death than if you don't and so what is an end of life experience well it starts with premonitions you might know uh, people who have had premonitions they would say to you so and so knew he was going to die sometimes it's violently through a crash and sometimes it's just the knowledge that they're going to die they're quite rare but nevertheless they're they're fairly powerful and the next thing is deathbed visions fascinating absolutely fascinating and the thing about deathbed visions is that the people who come and surround the deathbed are people you know usually your mum your dad your sister and in fact we did a we took 112 visions i think and 25% were parental figures then 17 percent 
were angelic beings or spiritual beings and then another 17 percent were other members of the family and it went right down to about three percent uh, in in the last group of people now um you're all going to be very disappointed if you have a cat like casper because he's not going to come i think in all the um end of life experiences we've had there's only been one animal angels pretty pretty rare about three percent of people see angels here but there's a huge cultural component because if you are in the bible belt of north america then there the rate is very much higher i spoke to uh, dr john lama who's a palliative care physician and he was saying that over there angels are quite common so we don't see them as i say only about three percent are angels otherwise they are uh, family figures like a mother brother or sister and they come how do they come well sometimes you see them looking in through the windows sometimes you see them in the corridors outside but they will finally come into your bedroom and how do you feel when you see them they feel absolutely real so is it the drugs talking absolutely not it's part of the way that that we die we see these uh we see our deathbed visitors and they are above everything else very comforting uh it's lovely to have your mum or if you had a good relationship with her or if you didn't your sister come and sit on your bed and when they sit on your bed you usually feel the bed rock a bit as if they really have sat on your bed so uh the first real question is is it the fact that you've been given morphine no evidence to support that is it that uh it's other drugs you're taking no evidence to support that is it a, a natural phenomena most likely this is exactly what happens so they come into the room and they console you and there's a palliative care physician who i met in um at one meeting she's canadian and she's from the canadian outback and of course a lot of people die uh without uh family members being present because they just can't get there and this woman was feeling very much alone and so the palliative care nurse used the end of life experiences to help her and uh, he, uh she said to her tell me who do you think will come if anybody's going to come and collect you and uh the patient said or the dying woman said uh, mary probably who's my sister and has died fairly recently we agreed that she would come back um when i was dying so the palliative care nurse said that's good and so each morning when she went in she asked uh, the patient has mary come yet and for two or three days mary hadn't and then mary came and so she said to the patient right tomorrow when mary comes go with her and that's exactly what happened and the patient died the next day having had um the visitation of her sister so they are very real in that sense why don't we call them hallucinations because they don't behave like hallucinations they occur in the setting of clear consciousness but people are dying so their consciousness is warped no it's not they can perfectly well tell that i mean some people are confused and of course many people uh, particularly if they have prolonged alzheimer's uh, will die from uh, a state of not really knowing what's happening but uh, those who do see them as real helpful and supportive most hallucinations certainly would never be described that way so don't think of them as hallucinations think of this as part of the dying process so this is about a fortnight before 
and do remember this so when you're dying in the hospice you can negotiate with your deathbed visitor so when your sister comes let's say um, you can say to her listen i don't want to die yet um, i want to wait until my son arrives they'll do that for you they'll say okay well you can you can stay a bit longer but uh they won't if you say to them um the hospice party which i'd like to attend <laughs> they won't pay any attention to that at all but if it's really important to you then they will so uh those are deathbed visitors um seen in all cultures um but as i was saying about the angels who come uh, there's definitely a cultural component to it. Now, the next thing is that um, as, uh, as you're with the deathbed visitors, some of them will lead you to another area, uh, which is, um, uh, it's described by most people who give descriptions of it as an area where it's um, a sort of waiting room. It's full of love, full of light, full of spiritual beings. And you go in there and they're also dead relatives. And then you go back to the hospice again. So they're another form of Ellie, the ones that take you into this area. And uh, so it's actually important that you, that you come to understand what's going to happen when you do lose consciousness. And they, they seem to do that. Now, there's several other things which occur in the death process. But my question from Jung was, what are end of life experiences? And that's what they are. Please, please uh, say to us whatever you want to say in relation to Yelly's. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I can go on with the death process, if you like, because it's important. Right. right. Uh, actually, I have a question about that later. Before we go on to that, yeah. one, uh, I, I heard uh, this question, actually, from many other people. Uh, are there any negative kind of experiences? Um, if there are, then does that mean they are because they are bad guys? And if people, dying people, uh, say to us uh, as a carer, us as a carer, that they had uh, very unpleasant uh, end of life experiences before, you know, uh, towards do the you, end. Do you know, um, in all the experiences we've heard, and this is what, if there was 2000, that's 12 years of dealing with this, I've never yet found anybody who's had a really terrifying near-death experience uh, we can make them absolutely horrid for ourselves if we want in other words let's say that I'm very attached to my family and I'm lying in bed and the thought of leaving my family and losing them is makes me very anxious then the whole process of dying will be in fact um, covered by this layer of anxiety but uh, if you hope to meet um, the devil or if you hope to meet some guy with a big sword who's going to cut your head off or anything like that no you won't um, one other form of unpleasant it actually comes a little bit more out of the NDE and that is that when you go into the process you go into a blackness and you move through a blackness and some people find that frightening but it's unusual in the actual death process itself it's more related to things like ndes so put that out of your mind right now no you're not going to have a terrifying uh, angel of death come along you know the guy with the scythe he's not going to be there it's actually are going to be really really tranquil if you allow yourself to be tranquil and so um practicing before 
you actually die the stages that you ought to go through i think is very important so i don't think that negative ndes i'm terribly sorry don't think that negative le's are common in fact they're so rare i haven't met them yet well that sounds quite assuring um now the question is why why are they visiting us uh do they think we will be lost uh when you die and move on to you know wherever we go um they could have chosen not to come to us what is the purpose of their visitation um i think the purpose of them is to reassure the dying i mean that that's certainly the purpose we give them um it, it depends if you how much of a reductionist you are if you see if you look at our science view of the world and one is totally reductionist that is they're just things which are going around in the outside world then uh, all non-local phenomena are just imagination and uh, just um, a disturbed brain but if you in fact allow for uh, non-locality in other words we're now looking at consciousness and what in essence i'm saying is that if consciousness is beyond the brain then you can get a, a quite different feel for what's happening and it looks as if uh, the actual death process itself and we've got some interesting data in this is very much a non-local process so to try and fit it into a reductionist framework that every experience you have is in fact just the disorder of the brain doesn't work very well and what about the the reality status of the being you are you are seeing uh, at this uh, you said um they are real I think what you said is actually the experience of the dying person is real, it's not hallucination. But is there any corresponding reality corresponding to the subjective experience? Or you talked about somebody called Mary. Mary is uh, visiting. Is it really Mary, uh, Mary who used to live here? Or <laughs> just, just image of Mary, but in fact, something else, kind of um, um, symbol or message or sign or kind of a sign language spoken yes. by some kind of deeper reality be beyond the veil. How do we uh, interpret the, the reality status of that image, Mary, there? I, I, I love the question because, of course, it's quite unanswerable. Um, but one can get fairly close to it. First of all, you can ask the people who experience it. They have no doubt at all. They say that the end of life visitors are real. They are, that was my mum I saw. And you see, what we're doing is we're being a bit artificial in, in a seminar like this, because I'm looking at death and assuming that death ends when death ends. It doesn't. And the latest data on that is that after-death experiences are extremely common. In other words, it isn't unusual to uh, people whose wives have just died, for the husband to wake up and feel the wife beside her. All right, that's a hallucination because they're grieving. Or um, they will hear them. And some people continue with conversations with the dying people for many years after they've died so don't don't make the death process an absolute thing it's not it tails off and of course as you become more used to the loss of your wife or husband or child um, then the after death phenomena become weaker but nevertheless they're always there uh, in most people, I think the, the study that I'm thinking of, about 90% of people have after-death communications. So they're not rare. 
and if you're just going to argue that this is a confusion of the brain that's not how they describe it they describe it as something very real very helpful and very supportive all right thank you um now let's move on to the um what happens uh to the soul who soul of the person who died um yes. where, where where does the soul go and what what does it do there i i understand um you met uh, dalai lama a few weeks ago and you talked to him about death process could you please tell us about that yes, in relation I, with this? Yeah. yes I can um uh it's quite true I've just actually come back from a visit to the Dalai Lama in in India and um I was invited to go out there because the Dalai Lama himself is enormously interested in consciousness and he feels that it's time that scientists uh, gave up their reductionist view of science and started in fact having a much wider view where non-local phenomena occur um, I'm just going to I'll mention more about that in a moment but non-local phenomena what on earth is a non-local phenomena it is something which occurs to someone in one place of the world and uh, another person in another place picks it up let me give you an example uh, there was a, a lady who was British and she emigrated to Australia and she was living in Australia and her son was in England and one day she um, she woke up with a light in the room which she didn't understand and then out of the light coming towards her dripping wet was her son and um her son got closer and closer and then she saw that he transfigured really interesting he lost his dripping wet clothes and began to shine with his own light and he said to her mom don't worry i'm okay and then the, the vision if you like ended at that point and of course she rang up England as soon as she could do to find that at that time he was in fact dying uh, of um, uh, drowning with a with a boating accident so th there are lots of stories like this so the actual death process can be broadcast uh, around and uh, one of the more, most interesting ones that we have is a submariner he was at the bottom of the Atlantic and he had this uh, sort of waking dream because they're, they're really very lucid in which his grandfather came to him and said I thought I'd just tell you that I'm okay so don't worry about me got in his bicycle and cycled off and in fact uh, they they don't give uh, news to um, um, uh, submariners of any sort, particularly if it's news which isn't terribly comforting. They wait till they're back uh, and uh, uh, on shore. Um, I think your computer's making some noise, um, and so um, when he got into port, he learned that um he had unfortunately his grandfather had died at about the time he saw him when he was at the bottom of the atlantic now that's a very nice non-local effect but you can also show non-local effects we've been looking at that uh many of you will have heard of random number generators and some of you won't uh, random number generators are generators mathematical generators which give a series of of numbers which in fact are not correlated at all they're all random absolutely random and there is the global consciousness project in which they have these random number generators throughout the world and events like uh the twin towers coming down you get 
huge changes throughout the world as in it seems to be that people's consciousness are affected by that um you also got it uh, and this is interesting in the oj simpson trial when people were waiting for the verdict <laughs> that apparently was a global affair and uh put a lot of random number generators uh unrandom and uh being interested in the dying process um we have been looking at what happens when we die um and so in a hospice in um uh in inverness we have had a random number generator and we've had six people who died and it's quite clear that in fact at the time of death there's a huge change from randomness in these generators now you would say well that's a local effect of some sort maybe it's all the upsets that um, the people have who are visiting no you can't argue that because uh one of our uh one of our um colleagues had a random number generator in his house which he'd linked to a great friend of his who i think was in it's uh greece or somewhere and at the moment that friend died then his random number generator uh lost its randomness in other words there was a pulse of something which linked him in belgium to the other person's death so don't think of death just as um a local event it isn't it's got a lot of non-local uh, components to it and i think probably we're, we're talking about the cell and the cell journey so let us um just go back a little bit on this do you remember that we were talking about the death process and i talked about you going into the spiritual world and coming back and then there's something else which may happen and this is called terminal lucidity now terminal lucidity is totally fascinating this is when it doesn't matter who you are uh, whether you've had a stroke whether in fact you've got severe alzheimer's and haven't recognized your family for a long time just before death your mind will normalize and with the normalizing of your mind you will um uh you'll recognize your family you'll wish them all goodbye sometimes you'll sink back onto the bed and die and sometimes you'll be uh you'll be relatively lucid for two days and then die now how are you going to explain that uh, particularly in somebody who's had profound alzheimer's for three or four years or sitting up in bed with a stroke which you have, may not have done for a long while so terminal lucidity is now an area of great scientific interest and i'm pleased to tell you that um, it has in fact been funded by nih study into what terminal lucidity is um, and I, I think there are other grant proposals being put in too because we must know how miraculously can the brain behave normally after the length of time that it has in fact been affected um i think we just don't have an answer to that at the moment uh so uh, we're talking about the soul's journey in fact but we have to in fact i think clear the hurdle of um uh terminal lucidity because this gives us some indication that the whole person can even when they are in fact disturbed by the death process itself can come forward and communicate with uh, the people around them so this would in fact straight away lead you to the possibility that mind in some way is outside the brain it has to be because the brain has been shot up either by vascular abnormalities or abnormalities of alzheimer's that sort of thing and uh, yet at that moment you can become lucid and and say goodbye to the family totally fascinating um and then um the soul well what is a soul 
Um, it depends now uh, very much on where you're coming from. If you're coming from a Christian culture, coming from a, um, a Buddhist culture or another one, then you will have your own explanations. And I think actually it's probably worthwhile just talking about this a bit because uh, when I was speaking to the Dalai Lama, um, he was very clear about the death process and it's as follows. The Dalai Lama says that we're composed of sheaths um, of consciousness and what we do as we die we should refine those sheaths and refine them and refine them to the sense that you finally have no sheaths left and then you come to something which he calls the clear light and the clear light is your escape route from another incarnation and another um uh, 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 another spell on this planet um so uh if you don't want another spell on this planet and you do want to escape then you have to in fact identify the clear life clear light um which comes at the initiation of the uh he calls them the bardos the areas that you're going to uh, of the first bardo when you die so um to get off the tread wheel then you have to learn about keeping your mind absolutely still uh, and refined and it's a refine refining process now is there anything like that in our culture oh, yes there is um there is a palliative care theologian who works in Switzerland and she has done um, a lot of work on uh, how people transition and she, she uses the words pre-transition, transition, post-transition. Post -transition. I think they're helpful and I'll tell you why. Pre-transition is a period about 24, 48 hours before you die. Now, most people know that they're going to die um, if they are at all sensitive to how the process is going. And in pre-transition, you have the ability to choose. You can regret everything you've done, say, oh, woe is me. Or you can say, oh, God, um, I'm going to lose my lovely wife and daughter and my cat. I've got a cat like Casper, which we do. And that will make you very sad. Now that sadness you will take through into the death process and that will mark your transition. So we've got this idea within our culture of in fact being, um, giving up your attachments in the pre-transition phase. Now that actually is quite good because it means that you're no longer so anxious. You're no longer so worried. Okay, you're dying. You had a nice life or not a nice life. At any rate, you're dying. So the thing to do is to go through the death process without all these attachments. Uh, remember, we're talking about soul. So what goes through and where does it go but let's just go on with this so um in transition itself you um the egoic structures those part of the brain those of you who are neuroscientists will know the default mode network it's a whole set of structures which in fact um underpin the ego they um, start to deteriorate and, and become much more absent in the in transition. And then you come to post-transition. Transition can be quite difficult for some people. But at any rate, it's not going to be difficult for all you people because you know it's coming. 
and you know that you're going through the death process and you know that you're all nice and calm and relaxed and then you come to tra uh, post-transition and uh, the thing about post-transition is that you um, you change your level of consciousness. Now, I'll just give you another concept here. And this is the idea of non-duality. Now, uh, most of us, if we're not non-dual, in fact, have an experience, an eye inside here, looking out on the world. And that's duality. It's broken up. An eye looking out at what's outside. Now, when you come to non-duality, you lose that perspective. You are everything in one. And this is, according to Monica Rentz, very common in people who are post-transition. So our form of consciousness changes uh, as we come up to the actual event of death itself in, um, in post-transition. So in other words, you can begin to see that as you're dying there, you've got a huge expansion of consciousness because you have become everything just before you die. And um, uh, I think that uh, what she had published a graph and I can send them to uh, Ying Hai and he can let you have them. And she uh, did an analysis four times a day of four characteristics. They were fear, um, anxiety, and there were two other characteristics. So it's a massive study. Three or four times a day, she'd go around and ask her dying patients to rate themselves on this. And what she found was that there are certain things and mental attitudes which people have which protects them in the dying process. And that is um, that uh, if you are absolutely calm, you go into non-duality, then you become everything and you're not anxious. And she's got a graph of those who are anxious and those who are not anxious. And the question she asked was, um, are there any behaviors that the people have uh, coming up to death, which in fact is protecting them? And the answer to that is yes, they are. And uh, one of the ones, 90% of people who have no anxiety at all, any of you like to guess, or those who've had no death, near death experiences, they know about it. So they're not anxious. And they go through the death process without any anxiety. Who else? Well, probably wouldn't surprise you to find out those people who meditate have much less anxiety than those who don't. And um, there's uh, another group, and this is the group I recommend to you because you may not have a near-death experience and you may not be a meditator, but there's no reason why you shouldn't be curious, curious about the death process. So as you go through it, be curious. They have much less anxiety. So I recommend to you that you, in fact, are curious as you're lying there and thinking, oh God, well, actually, you won't think that because you will be non-dual. You will be everything. And just be curious what the next step is going to be. And that means you will have much less anxiety. Now, let's talk a little bit about the next step. What on earth is it that goes on? Well, it depends upon your culture. For example, uh, the Dalai Lama is absolutely clear. Um, you have your core self, your soul. And that goes through multiple incarnations. Um, and to get out of your incarnations, you, um, you have to see the clear light, which means you have to go through 
I suspect, the dying process being curious. Because if you're curious, it's actually quite difficult to be frightened at the same time. Because you, of course, will give it up and you'll just become frightened. And that's not what I'm saying. It's, what I'm saying is be curious and hold that as you die. And then um, the, we come into this whole question of the Buddhist concept of um, uh, multiple lives. And here you have to be really very clear about the data. And the data from being one or two people, children who come back and say they remember a previous incarnation to a flood of studies. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Bigelow and the Bigelow Prize. The Bigelow Prize was given by this uh, multimillionaire of uh, $500,000 for the first prize, two fifty dollars for the second, a hundred for the third, and then um, uh, lesser amounts for the uh, other um for the uh, other people who came lower down uh, until there were some essays which were just so good they couldn't be thrown out after all the prizes be given that he's in fact generated another category um of special mention and uh, there were two thousand there were um they all got tw uh, twenty thousand dollars and I'm pleased to say that uh, our group uh, uh, got a special mention. So that's very good. But it's not why I'm telling you that. Why I'm telling you that is there is this huge bank of data about the dying process and is the life after death. And I would recommend that you read um, uh, those essays. And then you can come to your own mind. Let me just uh, talk about one of them. I think is the guy who um, came third. He's he's English, and um, he um, described and I like this simile, uh, uh, the simile of a pilot flying through a storm, and his reality are the dials in his cockpit and the dials tell him about the reality in other words that he's going up and down how fast he's going etc etc but they tell him nothing about the storm you can't learn about the storm by looking at the dials and this has become really quite a a um, important view now that we have absolutely no idea what reality is out there. We can only tell about reality by looking at the dashboard. And so one of the things we know about reality is that um, everything is moving. There's nothing which is stationary. All the atoms are circulating around uh, other atoms and molecules and so on. The whole thing is a mass of movement. And what do we see? We look at our dashboard and it says, yep, it's all solid there for you guys. Don't worry, it's not moving. We're well, only moving when the brain's not working, and the dashboard isn't functioning. So the concept of the dashboard um, and what reality really is, is I think a very nice one. Now, the reason why I'm talking about uh, these, um, these essays is firstly because they are uh, uh, enormously important. A huge bank of data there answering the question, is there life after death? And if you're going to have a soul, the concept of a soul, then you want to know that. And so where do you go? Where do you go to those papers? And what sort of things are you going to look at? You're going to look at that group of people who say they have lived before. Are they all deluded? No, there's a lot of data on that now. Uh, children before the age of seven usually have some uh, idea that uh, they uh, uh, lived in a previous life. And of course, all those people who uh, um, 
are, are really convinced. And there are a lot of studies on these people, first of all, by Ian Stevenson, the University of Virginia, and now Dr. Tucker, or Professor Tucker, um, uh, is looking at uh, those uh, who have past life experiences. So uh, look at the data, and then you can make your own minds up. But it's important to see the extent of the data and uh, the um, the idea. Yes, there was a meeting the other day uh, of, of the Scientific and Medical Network. And I was interested to know because they were talking about people's previous experiences. And so I asked uh, the people who were lecturing if there is any evidence in people who have uh, experiences early in life, if they have lived before. And they said, yes. Um, it's not all that uncommon in young children. By the time you get to uh, being an adolescent and a young adult, you don't know anything about it, of course, because you can't remember. By the time you're my age, you can't remember anything like that. So um, we, we have to accept what the data is actually showing us. And one thing I wanted to know is, it was actually triggered by one of the Dalai Lama's comments. Uh, well, this is my interpretation of his comments. You can't obviously uh, give the Dalai Lama, say the Dalai Lama said something, that would be quite wrong, but you can say your interpretation of what he said, and then you have taken it away from him being directly responsible. Climate change. And so, I was interested in that, and he said, uh, it looks as if uh, the, the planet is going to go through a very difficult period. But he said, it um, doesn't matter. There are lots of other planets out there. Now, this is quite a different philosophy. Uh, we think of only one planet. He was thinking of multiple planets. Um, and so one of the questions I asked at the meeting was, in the children who have reincarnation memories, do they come from different planets? And the answer to that was, some of them do report that. So make of that what you will. It's interesting, but if you are interested in the ideas, do go back to the original data. And the Bigelow papers would be a very good place to start. I think there are, oh, there are probably about 40 of them. And so it would keep you happy for a long time. But the dashboard theory of the relationship between us and reality is a good one. Have I answered the cell question? Oh, well, yes, very much. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add? Okay. Yep. Okay, I mean that the, the beings from other stars uh, who are with us. That, that idea is uh, fascinating. I mean, we perhaps we have to invite the Dalai Lama uh, to our group and and have some more stories about that. Uh, from him. we have uh, colleagues from UFO uh, group here, and that idea. Uh, I mean, beings invisible to us, or actually planets invisible to us, is is not. Uh, un, not unfamiliar idea. Um, so there should be very interesting talk if we have uh, Dalai Lama with us in the future. But uh, time, actually, we don't have much time. Could you just, uh, Peter, uh, make briefly, brief comments on, imagine we, we are dying tomorrow. All of us, we are dying tomorrow. What should we do, given what you said this evening? Oh, to die very... well. <laughs> to die well. It's very simple. Give up all your attachments. Be curious and let it happen. Let it happen. Yeah. But be curious. Don't let it happen saying, oh, my God, that's no good. Got to be absolutely 
absolutely relaxed about the whole process. So it needs practice. Um, you, you remember, I can't remember the name of the saint now, but somebody lay down on his bed. It's Marana, Marana Mahashi or somebody, I'm not sure. And uh, he became enlightened by falling down into death. And that's really what we ought to be doing. Go and lie on your bed and think I'm dying. What will I miss? Then give it up. Uh, what's the thing that I'm worried about losing? Then give it up. And so that you start practicing this process of giving everything up. And you'll have a much, much better transition. I mean, there's, there's just no doubt about that. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I had actually other questions, uh, but uh, because of the time, limited time, perhaps uh, we should look forward to another occasion uh, to, to complete uh, those questions. Now, uh, I will open this uh, forum to uh, our audience. And if you have any questions, please use reactions there. If you look at uh, the bottom of the screen, you will see reactions and raise a hand. Uh, I hope there are also the chats. Let me check quickly what have been chatted about. I hope there's not questions. No, there are not questions, I believe. And okay, so uh, please raise your hands rather than using chat uh, box uh, to ask any question to Peter. Okay, Seth, please unmute your microphone. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi, thank Seth. you so much. Uh, I'm involved in the ET UFO world. I work with ET contactees, and many of the concepts that you've been discussing, uh, contactees have also experienced. Uh, they get messages about oneness and the purpose of life, past lives, future lives. I'm curious if you've done any work with ET contactees and do you see similarities? I'd love to, I'd love to work in that field, but I never have. Yeah. Um, uh, no, are there such things? Well, if you look at the data that I've seen, so a lot of the data just recently released by the USA, that they all point to the being things that have come from outer space. I think you'll agree with that. So it looks as if there is something there, but I really can't speak on it because I haven't studied it. Okay. Thank you. But thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to put a chat uh, to raise my hand up. Can someone show me? Uh, okay, Ray, do you, do you have any comments to make shortly? Yes, uh, um, uh, Peter, I'm very... No, no, I'll, I'll go to Ron then yes. after you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just raise my hand. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you both, Peter and Yonghei. Um, I just wanted to, to, to say a thank you to Peter for his book, uh, The Art of Dying, which he's written with Elizabeth that I bought when it came out. Um, I, I was wanting to know, were you thinking of doing another edition of it? That's the first question. And the second was just to relate the lovely experience I had of um, telling a group about the grandfather's clock story. And yes. <laughs> having put that up on the screen this is because i'm running a course on the afterlife um i'm running it again in june in the lake district but i ran it in october and uh and then just you know to pull the cat out of the the, the uh, rabbit out of the hat you know to say you know did you know it was a true story and they go what <laughs> you know um and uh yeah so and you know they it what was lovely about the experience of that is you know gradually they shared other experiences that they'd had themselves you know um and uh it would be helpful just to know where people can send those experiences so yeah will there be a new edition and and where should we send experiences if we've got them Thank um you. if you've got experiences and uh i'd always love an experience um because uh 
I'm, are we going to, we keep talking to each other, that's me and my wife, <laughs> about doing another edition. And I think if we get enough experiences, we will, because they're very important. But can I just mention something here? We've been talking about end of life experiences. And now people are talking about shared death experiences. And this has thrown a huge confusion into the whole literature because supposing you have um, uh, your mother come and visit you, your dead mother come and visit you, um, it, and you uh, are with her in the hospice, is this a shared death experience or not? Uh, there's a, a very nice book by Peters on or Peterson on uh, shared death experiences, but I'll just tell you a shared death experience story. And that is that um, uh, this is one which came from a conference in Norway. And the lady had, um, she had lost her, her, her mother, I think her mother was dying and she, lady was not in the hospice she'd just gone home and she was asleep and in her uh, experience in her dream the mother came to her and said uh, I've got to go now or what's that effect and so the two of them set out on the death process together and um, there was the transformation excuse me, of light and love, that sort of thing. And then um, yeah, it became quite clear that the mother was going on and the daughter had to stay behind. And so the mother finally said goodbye, but it's a sort of prototypical uh, shared death experience. And it, uh, it was Raymond Moody who uh, wrote up near death experiences and uh, one of his recent books are shared death experiences. But I think really all the sorts of things we've been talking about are shared death experiences. But it's nice to keep it just for that very small group who actually uh, accompany the dying person as they die. And will they change? Really interesting question. If you go in the, along in the death process, just like people who are doing the near-death experience will you change and the answer is that once i've seen do so they get a change in consciousness after they have been exposed to that so yeah really interesting so thank you for the question yes we'd like to do another one thank you uh, Luis. thank you it's been an inspiring talk one of the things that's crossed my mind is that I'm lucky enough to be able to work mediumistically. And over the years I've worked with clients and brought, uh, I hope, evidence of life after death, uh, which I trust has brought come people that have come to me. But I feel I am battling a society where people who can bring messages of life after death are viewed as either woo-woo or charlatans or what have you. I feel I'm battling scientism or rationality or some of the world faiths who don't like people who work mediumistically to bring evidence of life after death. How can I therefore go about trying to bring this message that death is just a portal we pass through to something greater when we're battling faith and scientism. Um, I tell you exactly what I what I would do if I was you. You won't do it, Mark. You <laughs> <laughs> tell them about the Bigelow papers. Go right. and read the Bigelow papers. Right. When you've read those, come back again, and then we can have an informed conversation. Because what what you want to speak about now is data not belief structures and the data there is is so convincing about life after death i mean I, as from my own point of view um i i absolutely feel that that question is closed now 
yes, there is life after death. And uh, all the evidence pointing in that direction you can find in the Bigelow papers. So yeah. that's how I de de deal with the disease. <laughs> One of my tutors, a chap called Dr. Terence Palmer, submitted an essay to the Bigelow uh, project. I don't think he was picked, but it was very good. So, yes, thank you. That's why Council indeed, Peter, I'll do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Louise. Um, are there any questions? Array. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Younghee, for uh, sponsoring this important event because I believe that the NDE phenomenon, everyone in the world needs to be familiar with this phenomenon because it addresses numerous of the fundamental questions that we are born as human beings with. You know, is there life after death? It's just one of these many questions. And Dr. Fenwick has been a pioneer in this arena for many, many, many years. Um, secondly, Dr. Fenwick, um, I am very close friends with many um, PhD colleagues that have worked in your field and many uh, individuals in the field of parapsychology. I am, uh, uh, they are all members of, um, of my organization, not mine, but a, a cohort called the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute. And what we share in common is not only the belief in the afterlife and the belief in NDE literature, but we also share the hypothesis that consciousness is fundamental and not our physical reality. Now, there's several derivatives of that. Uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, which is one of my mentors, he viewed it from the perspective of a uh, holographic uh, view of consciousness, which is very similar to a virtual reality spiritual virtual reality model, because he was very, very spiritual in his own outright. Uh, but another commonality that we share is that all of what we call the contact modalities, and that is um, all the different ways that humans are piercing the veil of our reality and having contact with um, non-human uh, intelligence, i.e. near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, astral travel experiences, UFO contact experiences, remote viewing, ghosts and spirits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that all of us view all of these diverse, uh, quote-unquote, paranormal phenomena as one integrated phenomenon under the rubric of consciousness. Now, the problem that we are facing is that a lot of individuals within these separate fields before I began to work with them, had little conception of, for example, ufology. Uh, most of them totally dismissed ufology <laughs> uh, for many very, very good reasons. Uh, uh, Edgar uh, specifically stated in his book in 1973 that there was no academic research on UFO contact. And yet he was fully aware of that the phenomenon existed. That's why he'd included in his book uh, titled um, uh, Psychic Explorations, which he published in 1974. So um, for that reason, in 1920, uh, 2018, uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, uh, Dr. Rui Shields was a professor at Harvard of astrophysics. Dr. John Klimo, a professor for 45 years in, in psychology. Uh, Dr. Bob Davis, a professor of neuroscience, et cetera, et cetera. In 2012, we, then 2013, we started a research on UFO contact experiencer. And, and in 2018, we published that book. And what we found out was that almost the same thing as the NDE phenomenon <laughs> that these people were having. Um, Dr. Kenneth Ring started that in 1992 with his book, The, uh, the Omega Project, where he compared 85 people that had NDE experiences with 85 people that had UFO contact experiences. And what he found out is that it's almost a carbon copy of the same type of person. So we borrowed many of his questions, Dr. Ring is a friend of mine, um, in our research study, and we added like about 600 additional survey questions, including open-ended questions. And so I'd be willing to send you that book uh, uh, to your home. It's, it's very thick, 820 pages, but I, I will also send you like a seven page abstract so you can get at least the bullet points from the survey findings. Now, the reason why we did that, not because we were interested in ufology, 
Okay, people like Jeffrey Mishloff has an interest in ufology, but that's not his cup of tea. <laughs> you know, he's interested in the bigger picture. Almost everyone in the group. So now what we are doing now is we just published a four volume book series of the relationship between consciousness and the contact modalities. So we can introduce the audience members that there is that relationship there. We just need to begin to explore it. Um, and we're gonna be embark on a major academic research study comparing the experiencers um, of the contact modalities. Now, one interesting finding that we have, and this is maybe I could pose you the question, is that many individuals that have NDEs after their NDEs begin seeing deceased, ghosts and spirits. Um, and similar to many of the other contact modalities, they trigger other types of contact experiences. Like for example, um, my first experience started with an energy being in my living room. Uh, I went to Berkeley for a PhD. So I'm not just a crazy nut job here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I went to masters for a for a, a Cornell for a master's degree. I'm now a tax attorney with the IRS, a total atheist, biggest atheist in the world before my initial experience. But then I had a miraculous medical healing of our dog, who was totally paralyzed that we were going to be euthanizing that afternoon. You know, um, I won't go into the details of that. But then my wife began to call and pray at night to the Virgin Mary of Mexico. That's who she had prayed the whole night to. And a UFO would appear, a large UFO. So then like a few months later, I started doing it. I said, well, my wife could do it. Let me give it a try. And boom, these huge monstrous objects that were not physical, they were comprised of light configurations began to appear. And after that first day, I had four months of nonstop paranormal experiences, out of body experiences, astral travel experiences, seeing, you know, different forms of, of beings in front of me, getting telepathic downloads to the point where I went to a psychiatrist and he went through a list. Well, do you hear uh, messages? Yes. Okay. Do you see beings that are not really there? Yes. Do you, you know, blah, blah, blah. He ruled me a 100% schizophrenic. Okay. Right. Ray, could I interrupt you yes. for a second? So, could you could you shorten your yeah. statement? And we, we'll come back to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We'll so so the, yeah. the question is, have you heard of individuals that have had NDE experiences that began to have diverse paranormal experiences after their NDE? Yes, is the answer to that. It's not uncommon. I wonder, uh, have you read a book by Jeffrey Martin called The Finders? No, never heard of that book. Let me write it down. Okay, yes, do write it down. Um, because he's been running courses on uh, getting people to change their level of consciousness in, in using psychological strategies. And he's now got a very... Uh, comprehensive, I think he's got about 2,000, 3,000 people whose level of consciousness has changed. It's well worthwhile looking at that because one of the things that you find is that people who have had near-death experiences, um, in fact, shift their level of consciousness up his scale. Um, and so, in fact, yes, they do. They, they have a, a totally different understanding of what the physical world is all about so yeah. it, it backs you up very uh, very um in, in a very interesting way so, so if, uh, if if later on after we finish if uh, either you could li uh, leave with dr young he the uh your physical mailing address so you could leave it with us i would like to be able to mail you um uh these series of books that we have published uh, these are academic books um, uh, they're, they're, uh, even though they're written for the lay person, for example, we have five articles on non-local consciousness. Yeah. Uh, one was yeah. Edgar Mitchell's magnum opus that was only published in the Journal of Cosmology. So, you know, these are high yeah, level please, readings. Yeah, yeah. please do so. Please email me then so that I can uh, send it out to, to the, you know, people on the email list. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Are, are there any questions? If you don't have any questions, could I ask, uh, we have a colleague who actually researched on, right, uh, on other forms of experience. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Marian Rankin, um, 
who researched on uh, religious and spiritual uh, uh, phenomena and experiences, which have some kinship to uh, the experiences uh, we have uh, at the end of our uh, or towards the end of our life. So I'm just wondering whether uh, Marianne uh, has any comments uh, on, on that. Well, um, my, am I there? Um, yes. My research was really on the fruits of experience because um, there are so many different types of experience that people have, including NDEs and ELEs. And I was looking at what happened to them as a result of their experiences in terms of their consciousness, but also their response to other people around them. Specifically, I was looking at whether they became more altruistic, mm. um, which is a, a form of raising of consciousness, if you like, manifest in how they responded to people around them. And again, a change of perspective of what's important in life, what matters, um, that was really where my research um, was. So um, a fascinating study I did uh, on the Alistair Hardy Religious Experience Research Centre mm. archive, to which Peter and Elizabeth donated the experiences they uh, acquired for um, the truth in the light. So we kind of linked in that way. Um, but my research was really slightly different from levels of consciousness to how people were affected in terms of living this life to the best of their ability or to get things in the right perspective. But maybe these are attachments one then has to lose, Peter. I don't know. <laughs> yes, you do, I'm afraid. Yeah. Got to be a clean slate. None of those nasty attachments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still at the attachment stage, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you know such a lot about it that you'll give it up very easily. Yep. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Peter. And we'll go to Banzi. Yeah. Yes, may, may I just make a comment? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, 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 yes, please go ahead. We can hear you. Yes, yes, Peter, I know with your experience, you must have heard of hundreds, if not thousands, of people describing their impressions, uh, descriptions knowing that they're going to die before they die. Um, one interesting one, this was about 40 years ago. Uh, one of the um, people that I work with, uh, immediately after Christmas holiday, he came to work and he said, I think he lived near Clapham then, he had been to visit his grandmother, who was a widow, just lived a couple of miles away. He went on Christmas Eve to say hello to her. She was fully mobile, although she was on her own. She could look after herself, do her shopping. And so he thought he would just go round to see her and say he would be coming the next morning, Christmas morning, to collect her. So she would come and have Christmas dinner with him and his uh, parents. So he said, I'll just go into the kitchen, Gran, make you a cup of tea. He did that. When he came out with a cup of tea, she was sitting in the chair with her eyes closed. So he said, Gran, here's your tea. And she kept her eyes closed. Well, he said he thought she was just having a joke with him. So he said, come on, Gran. There was no response. So he tapped her on the shoulder. So um, then she had just, oh, I know, I missed one bit. When he went into the, just before he went to the kitchen to make the cup of tea, she said, I won't be coming with you tomorrow. And then it was when he came back out, she had apparently just died. So it was so interesting that um, she had just made that remark to him, yeah. knowing that, and then within five minutes, she'd passed away. Mm -hmm. Yes, she obviously had foreknowledge, didn't she, that she was dying. 
Yeah. Yes, thank you, Peter. Thank you for, thank you, Peter, for the story. I think we have only one uh, question to ask, uh, and we have to go to Bunzi. Uh, thank you so much. I'm actually really happy to have found this talk and uh, the group. So thank you for putting this on. Um, I sort of joined a little bit late, so I'm sorry if this question has been asked or answered. Um, but I guess, so there's this sort of eternal argument, I think, around you know, reincarnation and those that obviously don't believe in reincarnation. Um, I definitely do believe in reincarnation. I can recall, you know, some of my past lives um, and I, I intrinsically believe in the soul journey and that we carry on in terms of our consciousness, trying to raise our consciousness um, lifetime to lifetime until we can essentially reunite with source. Um, I think my question, I'm trying to sort of articulate uh, what, what the question is, but I've always felt that people essentially create the experience that they have in the afterlife um, through their own state of consciousness. And I've always felt that that is the experience of heaven and hell. And I think that's also true on earth as well. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any kind of thoughts or feelings on this and I'm, I'm not sure if you do and I'm not sure if that's really your area of research or if anybody else wants to sort of pitch in in terms of you know what they may think or believe around this but essentially it's around you know again the eternal argument around reincarnation and the day of judgment I mean do you feel that people experience that because that's essentially something they've created in their consciousness and that is then something they then go on to experience as part of their consciousness in the afterlife as such. I hope that makes sense. Uh, what a fantastic question. Thank um, you. It's, um, it's so important. Uh, heaven and hell. Uh, I haven't come across the hellish bit. I've come across a lot of heaven, but no hellish bit. Um, is that because I'm averse to hell? Well, I'll certainly be averse to hell, <laughs> but I haven't seen other people who've who've had hellish experiences, so I, I can't really contribute to that at all. Um, as I say, the, the near death experiences where the people are uh, are frightened by them is usually just going through a black void, and that's very scary, and then. Uh, you will see the light and then you'll go to the light and then the whole experience will transform into a positive one. So negative experiences, I, I don't know. I think it's a really interesting thing is that do make negative experiences not come my way because I don't want them to. <laughs> or are there just very few negative experiences out there. Um, the whole question about uh, soul journeys and going on, again, now there is so much data on this, that we can actually follow the data. And I think that's, that's really good. As I say, the, the Bigelow essays are a very good source. And they, really the whole idea of life after death is something which science has to move towards now. I mean, it, it's... Uh, it, there's tons of data that way. If you don't move towards it, then you need to ask yourself really interesting questions about your own belief structures. Um, so I think the the fact that uh, of an afterlife is important. Reincarnation, that's absolutely on, on the cards now. But all this requires non-locality. And... Um, uh, the example I gave was when somebody died uh, in one part of the world, then they disturbed a random number of generators in another part of the world. So the whole thing is non-local. And if you take if you take the view of the world from a non-local point of view, then the idea of multiple lives ceases to be the absolute bar to to understanding one way the universe is uh, is made 
no, I'm I'm very much with you in 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 what what you're saying and thinking. So thank you. Well, thank you very thank you much. So much. Uh, yeah, for those uh, those who ask very informative questions, and I knew uh, the talk uh, yearly will be expanded to to other related issues like Andes, uh, reincarnation, and even and uh, ufology here. Yeah. Well, actually, the the last question uh, Banja asked will be, I, I'm sure, will be looked at again. Uh, Peter will be coming back to us uh, on uh, two occasions in December, one uh, on the UK-Korea Death Forum. Uh, the time is a bit awkward for our colleagues in uh, North America. Uh, it will be 12 o'clock uh, in the UK time, uh, but if you can, please come back. And the second session uh, where Peter will be coming back is with uh, Reverend Lord uh, Rowan Williams, the 14th, uh, the, the uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, former Archbishop of Canterbury. And I'm sure uh, Peter and uh, Rowan will be talking about heaven and hell. I'm sure. and, uh, <laughs> and, <will. laughs> uh, and and Banzi, you perhaps you can you can expect a very I mean deeper answers because we, because we we didn't have time to to look at in detail today. So I'm planning uh, to join that one. So, yeah, yeah, please, yeah, please <laughs> pencil it in in your diary, and yeah. that will be 12th of uh, December, uh, same time, five o'clock, and I will send out schedule to, to you all and you can find all those uh, future schedules we'll talk about uh, reincarnation and and is again in depth and uh, we have uh, professor Keith word who will talk about uh, philosophical understanding of death and eternity so uh, there are some more schedules uh, in in the diary so please check uh, oxfordhumans.com uh, website, uh, you will find more detailed information. Well, Peter, thank you very much. It's, I mean, this evening's talk was so informative and is we had we heard so many good news really from uh, through your mouth. And well, I, I understand Peter, Peter, you, you like always send to send send happiness to, to others, to, to other people. And that's why you agreed to to talk to us uh, this evening. And could I ask you if you wish to send your happiness, joy, love, personal blessing to to all of us before we say goodbye to each other? Oh, very much so. I think that's <laughs> terribly important. Because as a group, we have power. And one of the powers that we have is to, in fact, spread love and kindness. We certainly don't want to spread hate and anger. Love and kindness is something which a group can do. And so I would send that out to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's already uh, 6.37 in the UK, and I wish you all the best until we see each other again. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.